Kia ora tātou. No mai hare mai ki te hui inga. No mai hare mai ki te hui i tēnei pō. Kei te mihi ki a koutu ki ngā mana whenua o tēnā rohi o tēnā rohi. Kei te mihi ki ngā kuia, me ngā karaua, me ngā pākeke hoki i rotu i tēnei ruma, i rotu i tēnei kaupapa hoki. Tēnei te mihi ki a koutou i tēnei wā o koanga. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko te karaki a tēmatanga, tukua te wairua ki a rere ki ngā taumata, hei ārahi a tātou mahi, mā tā tātou whai, i ngā tikanga a rātou mā. Kia mau. Kia ita, kia kore ai e ngaro, kia pupuri, kia whakamaua, kia tina, tina, haumi e, hui e, tai ki e. Oh, kia ora beautiful, beautiful people and welcome. Welcome to tonight's webinar, How's the People? A panel discussion about the potential for public housing as a response to our housing crisis. Tonight is a collaboration between Public Housing Futures and Action Station, which grew out of a sheer concern about how the private market has completely taken over our ideas about how our housing system should work. We need many solutions to truly resolve our housing crisis, but we reckon that public housing is often left off the agenda as an exciting and hopeful intervention that could make a meaningful difference to all of us and especially to those most in need. So we wanna have a yarn reveal tonight about why we don't talk about this option enough and what incredible public housing futures could look like in Aotearoa. Now tonight is just an hour long, it's short, it's sweet, and each quarter will get us straight to the heart of the kaupapa of the topic at hand about public housing. So first up, we have researcher Vanessa Cole, who will get us started with a history of state housing in Aotearoa and how we ended up here. Next, we will have Phoebe Carr, who has just arrived back from living in a public housing complex in Sweden. She's going to share with us what that was like and what we can learn from it. And lastly, we have Max Harris, who will talk about the economics around public housing. Now, the question box will be open throughout the hui tonight. Um, but we will need to see how we go for time, depending on how many questions we can take. You can also share your questions or ideas in a feedback form that we'll post at the end. And that way we can respond to them with the time and thought that they deserve. So if, if there's a bit of interest around a particular questions, we can do another webinar or a social media series that has been shaped by some of those, those ideas and those things that you'd like to know more about. On a practical note, this is the first time we're using sign language interpreters and live captioning at Action Station. So please bear with us as we learn how we do this well. If you are using these services and have any problems, please put a line into the Q&A box and we will do what we can to help out. A huge thank you to Wordsworth Interpreting, AI Media and to Internet New Zealand for helping make this happen. Now, if you have to leave early and get the kai on or get the kids to bed, um, Katie Paitena, all good. The webinar is being recorded and live streamed on the Action Station Facebook, so you won't miss out if you do want to catch up a little bit later on. And before we start, I think it's important to note that you're probably already going to notice here that each of the speakers here tonight, including myself, we all come from one kind of generation. And we're the generation that has only ever lived in the Aotearoa post rogenomics okay? So we have only known a country where the gap between the rich and the poor has been ever growing, where the user pay system is just normal, and where cash rules everything around us, all right? We can't go back to a nostalgic memory of the housing past. We can only imagine what a better future can be that serves all of us and the generations yet to come. So I wanted to first share with you the original Public Housing Futures vision. This is what we have been imagining and we invite you to imagine with us. Aotearoa is well known for genuinely affordable, accessible, healthy, sustainable and beautiful housing for everyone. And our vision homes are for living first, not profit or investments. Kitiriti or Waitangi guides us in how we do housing. Decisions around the housing system are always made in meaningful partnership with tangata whenua. 
Māori express tino rangatiratanga on housing when it comes to hapū, iwi and whānau. Papakainga and Māori housing aspirations are thriving. There are always pathways for whānau to return to their ancestral homes, to live as Māori, by Māori and of Māori. There is an abundance of public homes, meaning that people can live where they are from or move freely to different areas without financial pressure. In our dream, we have universal public housing, which means everyone has a home they can stay in for as long as possible. There are no empty houses while people are deprived of a home. In this dream, public housing is built with universal design, so it's 100% accessible and meets the needs of our country's multicultural society. It allows intergenerational housing. Building developments enable communities to thrive by living close to family, the work they do, and the services they need. Homes are always treated as being part of natural ecosystems, culture, and histories. Local communities have a say over new housing developments, and those new developments actively combat gentrification and displacement so no one gets kicked out or left behind of their communities. So that's a bit of the future we are dreaming of. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to our first speaker, Vanessa Cole. Kia ora, Vanessa, welcome. Kia ora koutou. Um, my name is Vanessa. I grew up in Te Atatū North in West Auckland, and I moved around a whole bunch of private rentals in central Auckland, and I found my way back to the West, zooming in from New Lynn. Um, I have been thinking, organising and researching around state housing for the past 10 years, most of my adult life, and have dedicated the rest of my life to getting the government to commit to a public housing programme to not only house the waitlist, but to be an alternative rental housing system for many of us who want a secure home. I got involved in public housing work through the Tamaki Housing Group, which was a group of state housing tenants and their supporters who stood up against the state-led gentrification process in Glen Innes. This is where I learned everything I know about state housing, about what it has meant for communities who are able to live together securely under housing policy for life, and how this created the conditions for people to build strong relationships to their community. It is where I witness the pain that happens when this security is threatened through eviction and displacement. It's where I learned how real estate operates, how developers and landlords profit from regeneration led by the government as they start investing resources into disinvested communities, only for it to be captured and some people in the community priced out and not see the benefits of this. It's also where I learned about the complicated history of state housing, both a history of collective care that we should all be proud of and hold a collective responsibility for, but also a history of displacement, exclusion and complicity in colonisation. I have been involved with All Connection Against Poverty, where I witnessed the growth of the public housing waitlist and the growth of people living in emergency accommodation. This to me was deeply connected to what I saw in Glen Innes. A lack of investment in public housing for years, alongside policies to evict families from state housing and to tax state housing as a tenure. I want to speak to some of these histories today because if, if we are here to look at public housing futures, we really need to understand what happened to our state housing program, what allowed it to be stripped from us in generations to come and how we can create a vision for public housing futures. The state housing program, as some of you will know already, um, really flourished out of the first Labour government and kicked off in the late 1930s. While there were some forms of state provided housing before this, in particular, the building of workers dwellings under the Richard Seddon government, it was the first Labour government that expanded this program. Some of you might have in your mind the iconic image of Michael Joseph Savage carrying furniture into the first state house in 1937, with a crowd of hundreds of people watching this spectacle. The, the state housing program in Aotearoa 
was one of the many responses to the economic crisis at the time. It not only was about housing working class families, but also about stimulating the economy through local industry and construction, providing jobs for those who were made unemployed during the depression. Houses were built as a part of wider suburban planning. It was largely built as standalone houses with the idea that they, did, they wanted to avoid reproducing the high density housing of England. There were already criticisms at the time that the focus should be on building more dense urban housing close to work and amenities. Each home was similar, but all had unique features. They were built with the idea that state housing should be on par with home ownership. There is a tendency, and I'm guilty of it, of romanticizing when we look back at state housing because it was so ambitious. But I think it's important to remember that it was never perfect. Māori and sole parents were excluded from this program when it first started. It was focused on housing Pākehā, nuclear families in a three bedroom standalone home. Some of the lands on which state housing was built and materials used to build state housing was a result of confiscation and displacement of Māori from their lands. Rent was too expensive for some people and while the government managed to build 30,000 state homes over 10 years, the program was not able to address the ongoing housing crisis and wait lists were long. The fixation on individual home ownership as an aspiration still remained. In the 1950s, the national government introduced legislation to allow state tenants to buy their home. This was a way of moving state housing from the, into the private market. While it was appealing for many tenants to be able to own their own home, every home that was purchased meant one less state house. Alongside this sort of privatization, one of the key issues in the history of state housing is its residualization. A big word, but pretty much it is the idea of thinking about public housing tenure as temporary and that people will move up the housing ladder. State housing, while its roots, we're in providing housing for many, just as good as home ownership. Over the years, it became more and more a tenure for only those in the most need. And this was purposeful. Residualization made state housing more vulnerable to attacks by successive governments, more vulnerable to stigma by the general public, and led us to thinking about state housing as a temporary tenure on a housing continuum instead of a publicly owned one that we all have a stake in and that we all deserve access to. If we look at countries which did not have a residualized public housing program, such as Vienna and Austria, the program is still flourishing because living in public housing is commonplace. Not only those on low incomes, but public servants, teachers, nurses live in public housing. This more universal model has allowed public housing to survive even with drastic changes to the political context. In Aotearoa, there has been a history of national governments selling state housing and labor governments building housing. In 1991, in line, in line with neoliberal reforms, the national government introduced full market rents to try to reduce the state's role in intervening in the housing market. They replaced income related rents with accommodation supplement. This had disastrous impacts on people who could no longer to afford to live in their state homes and were forced out and into overcrowded living situations. After a long battle and protest by SHAG, State Housing Action Group, this was scrapped by Labour in 1999. I'm now going to skip my way to the fifth national government, that's John Key's government, and their social housing reform program and talk about three key policies that were brought in to attack state, the state housing program. Urban regeneration and mixed tenure, income related rent subsidy and the creation of a social housing market and reviewable tenancies. Mixed tenure is a policy which that started to be adopted by central and local governments in urban regeneration projects such as Glen Innes and continues to dominate public policy and projects in Porirua, Māngere, Northcote and Mount, Mount Roskill. Mixed tenure is a policy of replacing state housing with a mixture of a third public, a third affordable and a third private market. 
It's complicated because mixed tenure presents itself as a policy which addresses urban segregation. The issue here is that public housing concentration does not cause poverty. And by building expensive market rate housing in a community, you do not solve poverty, you just hide it. I'm going to be frank. Mixed tenure is a policy built on a neoliberal fantasy of trickle down. That somehow living next to a wealthier neighbor will give you more resources and status. This really happens. And much of the international research into mixed tenure suggests that building private market housing drives up rents, pushes out private renters, and the public housing tenants that remain find themselves isolated in a community they can no longer recognize. If mixed tenure is about creating more diverse communities, we would see public housing being built in wealthy suburbs, but this is often not the case. If regeneration was about building the stock to make it suitable for tenants and increasing density, we would be seeing more fully accessible apartments and intergenerational housing being built instead of inaccessible townhouses. If regeneration was about increasing our public housing stock to house those on the wait list, we would be seeing the weight of public housing being 70% or even 100%. Instead, we are seeing two thirds of the land that used to hold state housing being sold to developers for market housing to be built. This is land that we can't get back to build more public housing in the future or to return to mana whenua. Regeneration could have been an opportunity to recommit to a state housing program for the 21st century. But instead, we are seeing a state-led gentrification program, which is contributing to people being priced out of their communities and more people in emergency housing. The better way to address segregated neighborhoods without the impact of displacement is to build lots of public housing everywhere and expand the public housing tenure to more people. The other policy that the Fifth National Government brought in was around income-related rent subsidy being extended to charities and other providers, but not to councils. There was an intention to wholesale transfer state housing to other providers, which happened in Tauranga and Tāmaki. While community providers have always held an important role in providing housing, the intention of this policy by the national government was to further reduce the state's role in the provision of housing to move it from a public resource to a social housing market. The final part of national government's social housing reform program was reviewable tenancies, alongside moving the role of allocation to MSD, the Ministry of Social Development. Tenants were reviewed on a criteria with the objective of moving people from state housing into private rentals. This led to situations where families were told that the grandparents would be relocated to a single unit and their children would need to find a private rental. People were told that their minimum wage job meant they were earning too much and could therefore afford a private rental. On top of this, a program of meth testing was rolled out, which was evicting families from their homes with faulty testing methods. This was a program of mass evictions from state housing. It's hard to locate information around where people ended up when they were evicted from state housing but I can tell you from anecdotal stories of working with families that they ended up in emergency accommodation. People moved into private rentals and could no longer afford them. The selling of state housing stock meant there were not enough homes to house an increasing wait list. The regeneration of neighborhoods meant people were moved out, moved from home to home, from community to community. The attack on state housing for generations has played a major role in the crisis we are witnessing today. The housing wait list is nearly at 30,000, but the number of people who need public housing extends far beyond this. The criteria for even getting on the wait list is so limiting, and once you are on it, MSD is constantly trying to get you to prove you are looking for private rentals while you wait. There are many renters in this country who rely on accommodation supplement to afford their rent and should have access to public housing, but would not fit the current criteria. We need to increase the public housing stock to a level where we not only house the waitlist, but are able to open it up to all people who need a secure rental. 
We don't just need a massive build of public housing to address the crisis. We also need to re reimagine what public housing could be. Public housing which is not residualized and is instead an option for many people just as good as home ownership. Public housing which reflects the communities that is built in, which is fully accessible, culturally appropriate and intergenerational. Public housing which upholds tetsuriti and involves the return of land and allows space for Māori to have self-determination over their housing futures. Public housing which is sustainable and works with density design in a way that, place, that creates places for children to play, common rooms, and is connected to good quality public amenities and infrastructure. Public housing which provides people and families a secure home to live in and is legislated for life. The lesson I take from the history of the state housing program is that it is possible for the state to be ambitious and build housing for the people. Public housing, despite its past flaws, has provided secure homes for people to build community. It has sheltered people from market forces. We need to build on this and create public housing futures which carry these histories, both the joy and the pain with us as we pave new ways forward for imagining what publicly owned house, housing could be. Most importantly, public housing is for all of us. It's something we collectively own and should collectively care for and about. While the state lost its way about, around state housing, or maybe never truly believed in it, it is up to us to build the house, public housing futures that we want. Back to you, Cassie. Kia ora, Vanessa. I really love what you said at the start about in order to be able to imagine our public housing futures, we need to know about our state housing past. And I just always appreciate what you share in terms of that, that history, because as I mentioned before, for some of us, we the only things we know about public housing is state housing that people don't want to live in that's been underinvested in um, that was then sold off <laughs> and now is barely available and so thank you for casting a bit more light onto our history because it tells us that um, that that we can do things differently in the future I also just want to shout out to a couple of our participant participants um, Jasmine and Rachel for letting us know about the interpreter um, um, screen so it should be okay from now but if there's any other um, concerns that pop up please do use the Q&A box and we have a team here who are on it and our apologies for taking a little while to get that up and running. Okay I'm now going to head over to Phoebe. Phoebe has seen the future or the Swedish past or whatever it is and she's here to bring the good news of what things look like. In, in a place far from our own. Kia ora, Phoebe. Kia ora. I'm very evangelical about um, Scandinavian public housing. Uh, tēnā tato, ko mā tātua tuaka, ko nā tūhoi me nā te awa, nā iwi, ko nō uh, no wera ingarangi, ko te rā nā koroatia o kuti puna pākehā, ko Phoebe Aho. So my name's Phoebe and I love public housing. I have recently moved home to Whakatane after living in Sweden for six years. Um, four of those years were in public housing in Gothenburg. I feel passionately that we should take lessons from Sweden um, and create public housing here that is beautiful, plentiful, universal and affordable. I'm just going to share my screen and I'll give you a moment to just adjust to the shared screen. So this image that you are seeing here is a picture of my partner Mikel, who's dragging my son Leif through a sunny park-like uh, space with, um, you can see four tall triangular blue buildings behind them. I, we used to live in the third floor apartment over here um, and it was the best place I've ever rented um, for sure. So. Our apartment had two bedrooms, uh, it had a roomy kitchen, a small functional bathroom, 
Uh, it had a large lounge right on the sort of end of the triangle, which gave it a really funky shape. Um, it was about 70 square feet. It was light, dry, really warm, even when it was minus 18 outside. It was beautiful and it was very family friendly. The building is 11 stories high. On every floor, there's about three apart. There's three apartments on every floor. I think the top, there might only be one. Um, each apartment could legally house six people. However, I think it averaged probably about four people per apartment. So we had about 130 immediate neighbors within our tower. But honestly, it was you would never know it. Like it was just really well designed. Um, and so every apartment was sunny and private. And yeah, it didn't feel like you were living with so many other people in an apartment. Uh, you're just gonna have to take my word for it because it really was great. Um, I'm gonna move now. This is an image of the buildings when they were first built in the 1950s. So our building was one of five triangular buildings um, and a bunch of other housing on the same estate. And on that estate, there, was, uh, a, there were allotments for residents who liked to garden. There was a small dairy, a hairdresser, a kindergarten, a half-size soccer field. There were saunas, like for residents. Um, there was like women's nights and men's nights and stuff, and mixed, I think. Um, there was a playground and it was very close to a forest, like really beautiful big forest. And there was a community square just down the hill where all the shops were and the community square was pedestrian. So I loved that. Um, and this suburb, this estate was in a suburb called Kortedala, 15 minutes outside of central Gothenburg. And there were lots of different estates like this and each one with their own amenities like barbecue areas and playgrounds and things like this. Um, my estate was probably the size of like, probably not even the size of a whole golf course, actually. It was probably smaller than a golf course. Um, so when we were living there, we never had inspections from property managers until we moved out. Um, and that's when they came in and they said, don't worry about these pinholes, but please do, you know, plaster over those ones. And here's a list of just things to clean up to make sure it's ready for the next tenants. Um, we decorated as we wanted. When we moved in, um, the woman who had moved, who had lived there before us had lived there for 50 years and she had never changed the wallpaper. So by the time we moved in, it really needed to be updated. And we were invited to go and look through all of these wallpaper books sorry, did I say, yeah, wallpaper books and decide which wallpaper we wanted in which room. And that was free of charge because it needed to be maintained and updated. So it was like a reasonable request. Um, we, children could move around the estate freely and confidently because there were a lot of places where they were far away from the roads and there were just lots of cool places for kids to hang out, like uh, the playground and stuff. Pets were allowed. There were lots of dog runs around the suburb. So you could take your dog and let them off the leash in a fenced environment. And also in some of the lower, um, the lower houses, the lower apartments, they would have cat ladders. So the cats could like just crawl out and hang out outside and then come in. I think when we do build high density public housing in New Zealand though, we should have luxurious um, communal catios just to save the birds. Um, and smokers, had their balconies. So even if you smoked, you were still allowed to have a place to live, which was pretty awesome. Your tenancy was secure unless you were really antisocial and violent and um, or you didn't pay the rent. So I would probably say that our suburb Portadala was kind of like Berimpur and Wellington, like the distance away and kind of um, the vibe as well. The distance from the central city and the vibe was kind of like the equivalent of Berimpur. So if you think about how much you would pay for a two bedroom flat in Berenpoor right now, um, I'm gonna tell you what we paid in rent there. And we paid $250 a week. And that included uh, heating, water and a parking lot. And I'll tell you about why um, we could, why it was so cheap later on. Um, but the low rent and the other aspects of Sweden's social welfare policies meant that my partner was able to study um, 
and I was able to work part-time. Our son didn't have to go to kindergarten full-time and that really took so much strain off us as new parents. <clears throat> we really felt at home at a place that we didn't own. Uh, we felt secure that rent wasn't going to just shoot up one day. And we were confident that when we needed maintenance, we could call the housing company and somebody would come and sort it out for us. Um, I'm going to start talking about the Million Home Program now. So this image is, it shows about 27 and eight story apartment buildings. They have concrete facades in green, yellow and cream and a built in a grid pattern with roads in between. These are typical buildings uh, that were built during the Million Home Program. I'll flick through a couple of other images of the Million Home Buildings as I speak. Um, not all of them are really beautiful, but we don't have to copy the aesthetic. So in the 60s and 70s, Sweden built one million dwellings in 10 years. This was in response to a housing shortage that had existed since the 50s. The Million Home Program improved the quantity and the quality of the housing stock. Every year from 1965 to 1974, the Riksdag, governed by the Social Democrats and led by Olof Palm, granted loans to municipalities to build 100,000 homes. So 100,000 homes a year for 10 years. At the time, the population of Sweden was about 8 million. One in four Swedes still live in homes built during the Million Home Program. During the construction period, the government took a comprehensive approach to housing policy and the overarching goal was formulated. The entire population must be provided with healthy, spacious, well-planned and appropriately equipped housing of good quality at a reasonable cost. One of the main aims behind the planning of the Million Home Programme was to build residential areas that could create good democratic citizens. The means of achieving this were to build at a high quality with a good range of services, including schools, nurseries, churches, public spaces, libraries, and meeting places for different groups of households. Um, this image shows my old neighborhood, Portidala. Uh, there is a mix of housing from high towers to row houses and freestanding structures. There's a lot of forest and there's a tram line and roads. Many suburbs in, in Sweden have great facilities and they house a lot of people. In many cases, it's density done very, very well. Middle and high density apartment blocks can be attractive, efficient and environmentally friendly. The World Population Review measures Gothenburg's current population density at 1,300 people per square kilometer. Wellington has a comparable area to Gothenburg, but much less people. Um, and the population density there is 900 people per square kilometer. Higher density in urban areas has been linked to better public transport and more effective use of rural areas outside the city. And that uh, means lower greenhouse emissions. So it's just a greener way to have things. I love this photo. Um, this is a photo from the 60s or 70s of children playing next to a fountain in a cityscape. Behind them is a tram and behind the tram are tall apartment buildings built during the Million Home Program. Opportunities for green transport and, and heating arise when you have lots of people living in the same place. So, Due to good planning, the public housing and public transport are very well integrated in Gothenburg. When you ask someone where they live, they usually reply with the tram line that they live on. So number 11 or something like this. Um, and the tram stop. Um, when I lived in Gothenburg, I never drove. It was often more expensive to drive because you'd have to pay toll roads to go into the city. Um, and I also never checked a tram timetable. Even when I was just like running out the door to work or something, I could just run five minutes to the tram stop and then a tram would arrive. There were like three that serviced my tram line within like five minutes. If you had to wait more than 10 minutes then something was wrong, 
and then you could zoom off. Our apartments in Portadala were heated by radiators and the water that flowed through those were heated by excess heat um, from nearby industry and also from the burning of waste. So when you build at scale, you can design elegant solutions to infrastructural issues like heating and transport. <clears throat> okay, so this is an image of some new public housing in Sweden. The buildings are yellow and orange, about six or seven stories high, and they're located right next to a beautiful canal with pedestrians strolling along the waterfront. So I'm gonna talk about market rent and why our rent was so low. So we didn't pay market rent, but our rent was not subsidized, it was negotiated. So the rent is negotiated between like a landlord's association and a tenants union. The tenants union represents about 90% of Swedish tenants. The rent must be the same for similar apartments in the same area, and a landlord must not be allowed to take advantage of housing shortages and therefore set a higher rent. The standard size and location of the apartment should be the deciding factor on the cost of rent, not who can pay the most. The union's objective is that tenants should not pay more than 25% of the average income after tax and rent. The union also works to shape public opinion on the interests of tenants, agitates for increased housing supply to meet demand, provides tenants with legal services and builds renters communities through events and activities. Um, right now, a new right-wing government has been voted in in Sweden, um, including the really horrific Swedish Democrats. Um, and a lot of those right-wing parties, this will be one of the things that they will want to start chipping away at is um, taking away the negotiated rent and putting in market rents. And when we think about the Swedes, um, the Swedish tenants and the tenants unions that are fighting to keep these negotiated rents, I think it's really important that for us, we just, you know, we expand our minds to understand that there are other ways of setting rent other than um, market rents. So universal public housing. On the left is an image of a suburban square in the 60s or 70s. Um, it is a pedestrian only space with children playing in a fountain and shops and apartment buildings in the background. The image on the right is a photo of Olof Palm, who was the prime minister during the Million Home Programme. Sweden's public housing is universal. Anyone can add themselves to a waiting list for a public rental. There is a public housing shortage though. So, I did get public housing because my partner Mikael was on the list for public housing in, Go in Gothenburg, excuse me, um, for eight years. So the, the list is pretty long now. Um, I think that universal public housing should be the goal here in Aotearoa. One of Olaf Palm's, one of Olaf Palm's basic ideas was the concept of general welfare policy. Everyone, regardless of their resources, should benefit from the welfare system. He believed that this would maintain solidarity and the will to pay taxes, and also help prevent the rich from obtaining private solutions out of reach of the poor. I think that when you look at Sweden's social policy, this has been the reason that it's been kept for so long, because we have um, parental leave that lasts 480 days, or we had when I lived in Sweden, um, we had Barnbidrag, which is a allowance for when you have a child. It was like, I think it was like $200 a month for each child that you have. When they turn 16, they get to have it as long as they stay in school and go to the upper secondary school. There's so many of these incredible public policies that have been maintained because everybody gets them. Um, I'm gonna leave now with a picture of my son. Here he is building medium density public housing integrated nicely with some rail networks. Um, he's building out of his toy toys there. I, I love this image because I think it speaks to an urge that most of us have um, to really create beautiful spaces and beautiful, efficient and like incredible places to live and to be in. Um, Vanessa spoke 
of New Zealand's history of, of public housing. And I think that New Zealand and Sweden had a lot in common for a long time, from like the post-war period up until the 80s. Um, but now New Zealand serves as a warning to Sweden of what can happen when we chip away at publicly owned assets like public housing. We're a much poorer country for it. We're a much less equal country for it. We've had the answers, or we've had some answers to the housing crisis before. We can look to other countries who have got great answers to their housing crisis crises today. And I think we need to look around um, at those inspirations to build beautiful, plentiful, affordable, universal public housing would be an epic project, one that architects, urban planners, builders and workers would relish. It could be done with our own unique flair and it would embrace value and it could embrace values like Fanonatanga and Kaitiakutanga, not just in a token way, but those values could be built into the social um, the social fabric, the social foundation through public housing. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna pass you guys back to Cassie. Oh, Phoebe, and what a gorgeous photo at the end as well of your son. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to now pass over to Max. Kia ora, Max. Tell us about economics and housing. Uh, kia ora, Cassie. Kia ora koutou. Um, uh, he pakia ho, he, he tori rio, um, called Max Toko Ingoa. Um, my name is Max. I grew up in Pornike in Wellington, and I now live in Otahuhu in Tamaki Makoto. Um, just to start with, I thought I'd mention that, like Phoebe, I spent a little bit of time recently in um, the result of public housing on the other side of the world. Um, so I lived for two and a half years in um, uh, a place called Vaughan Estate in uh, Bethnal Green in London, um, which is a public housing estate. Uh, it's championed by uh, supporters of public housing in London um, with a lovely courtyard, um, curved brick exterior. It was over the road from another estate called Dorset Estate, uh, famous for being designed by a renowned architect called Bertolt Lebetkin with a playground and park nearby, a little like what Phoebe was describing. And just up the road from the very first council housing in London, a place called um, Boundary Estate. Um, and I felt many of the similar things that um, Phoebe felt um, that I was living in this house as a renter because half of the houses in this estate had been sold off um, for private rental. But I'm not going to talk um, so much about that. And as Cassie said, I'm going to speak about um, the economic arguments for public housing, why a mass build of public housing makes economic sense too. So I'm just going to pull up some slides and give you a moment to adjust. What I'm just going to do quickly is to speak uh, first about um, some economic arguments for a mass build of public housing, then secondly, talk about a Ministry of Green Works as a vehicle for this, and then thirdly, try to deal with some counter arguments. Just um, at the outset, when I talk about the economy or the economic arguments, that's really a complicated way of talking about how we make and share and use things in society. Um, and the principles that we have for how we make and share and use things. I think we have to argue for public housing because of the human and social reasons that we've already talked about. But I think it helps uh, to have these economic arguments up our sleeves because when we talk about um, some of the things, for example, that Phoebe talked about, like whether the government here could build 500,000 homes in 10 years or a million homes in 10 years, um, we need to arm ourselves with arguments against those people who would say to us, the government shouldn't be in the business of building mass public housing at scale, or we can't afford it. So here are six reasons why we can afford it and why the government should be in the business of building public housing at scale. And um, if this sounds a bit technical, hopefully I'll explain it. And I've also tried to use a little mnemonic or acrostic poem, um, which hopefully you can remember uh, through the word inspire, N-S-P-I-R-E. So the first reason, uh, the first kind of economic argument 
uh, for why it makes sense to move from having lots of private uh, housing to a single government mass build of public housing is we take the contractors and the consultants out of the picture. No contractors or consultants. That's what the first bullet point um, in the slide says. And what I mean by that is at the moment with private construction of housing, you have a chain of contractors from uh, the land stub developers uh, to the property developers, uh, the architects, the builders, the lawyers, the accountants, the project managers, and many others. And at each link in that chain, you have a markup that is a profit being charged on the core service that's being provided. And that makes this process expensive and complicated. And when you have a single government public housing program, one advantage is that you can bring all of those people in-house uh, and deliver public housing without that chain of contractors or consultants adding extra profit or margin or markup to what is being delivered. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, and I'll just breeze through these quite quickly, is that you can build to high public standards because public housing is being built for people and not for profit. The overriding driver is not profit for a private company, but it is maintaining standards in the public interest. And that makes economic sense because if profit is the overriding driver, the incentive is towards cutting costs so that profit can be maximized. And what that has done in the past is created a whole lot of social cost. So you might reduce costs at the build stage, but you really just shunt a lot of those costs onto society. And a good example of this was the leaky buildings crisis in New Zealand in the early 1990s, which came from deregulating, loosening the rules on building housing um, and um, allowing profit to dominate. So maintaining public standards is actually something that makes economic sense. As I've already sort of mentioned, you can remove the profit margin as well if you have one government mass build of public housing as opposed to multiple competing um, private housing um, con construction companies. And that's important because profit margins at the moment are significant um, and uh, companies are making a, a, a major markup um, because in part they have to pay shareholder dividends. And actually this could become um, intensified um, with some of the forms of, of house building that are going on at the moment. For example, the much hyped build to rent model, um, which actually ties uh, housing into financial markets and uh, maximizes the drive towards profits. That's actually not a very efficient way of building housing because um, you have to add the cost of paying your shareholders or making a profit. And when we remove that profit margin, we can make more by building housing at cost price. So that's the third argument why um, it actually makes economic sense as well. So you take out the contractors, we can build to good public standards and we remove the profit margins. As Phoebe's already mentioned, you can also integrate and coordinate services. So Phoebe talked about playgrounds and parks you see this in the UK in council housing and state housing, the way um, housing can be linked to youth clubs, to other services, um, which can actually improve social outcomes and reduce the cost if we, if we are going to be using these arguments for other parts of our public services. So being able to coordinate things, which is what happens when you um, bring housing alongside other social infrastructure, is something that makes economic sense. It also brings in revenue for the government. So um, Vanessa and Phoebe have talked about income related rents, rents being tied to income. And um, that brings in a new revenue stream which can then go back into investing in housing. Excuse me, by the way, I've just got some um, music going on in the background here, but hopefully you can bear with me. If it gets too loud, I'll put my headphones on. The last economic argument is that you can um, have economies of scale. So when you have um, housing being built by one government provider, um, you can have um, basically a, a cheaper way of buying materials at scale. I'm going to just put my, um, I'm just going to see if we can get these headphones in. I think we'll be okay. Um, so economies of scale mean it's cheaper. And so you've got these six arguments. There's lots of other arguments as well about why this makes economic sense. Um, government also borrows more cheaply than the private sector. Um, it has lower borrowing costs, which also makes it cheaper, but those are just six arguments that you can pull out. The next slide here is about um, the vehicle that can be used to do this. 
Um, this is based on a report that um, I worked on with Jackie Paul and also Vanessa Cole. Um, there's some quite detailed images here for those of you not able to view the, the images. One is um, of uh, the title of the report, a Ministry of Green Works for Aotearoa New Zealand, and the second is the organisational chart that we put together. I won't go through every part of this because I'm, I'm not trying to show every part of this to you, but what it shows is one way that you could set up a, a, a mass build of public housing, which is having a public entity working with councils, iwi, Māori entities and hapū with three arms, a design arm, a construction arm and an oversight arm, and the Ministry of Green Works could have a focus on public housing and green infrastructure. In this report, we considered um, how the last Ministry of Works was often a tool of colonization, as Vanessa alluded to, and how a new Ministry of Green Works could be designed differently and as part of a path towards constitutional transformation along the lines um, envisioned in Matike Mai Aotearoa. So how you could set up a Ministry of Green Works at the same time as allocating resources to uh, iwi, hapu, and Māori entities um, to enable housing and infrastructure in the tino rangatiratanga sphere. So that's why a Ministry of Green Works could be a feasible vehicle for this. Um, to read more about it, you can see that online. Just in closing, um, I'll just mention some common counter arguments that come up. And I've tried to use here an acrostic poem, um, which hopefully you can remember through the letters B, S, K, F, C. Some people will say, isn't there a lot of bureaucracy if you want the government to build public housing? I think the best answer to that is actually sometimes red tape is important. If red tape is what is between you and a safe, healthy home, then maybe you need some bureaucracy sometimes. Maybe we need public spirited planners and architects and builders. Another argument is, doesn't the private sector have all the skill and specialization? That's the S and BS. The answer to that is you can bring some of that skill in-house. That's what has been done overseas in the UK when major renowned architects partnered with councils and with the state to build public housing. So that can be brought in-house um, and there's no reason why that skill can't be developed and cultivated um, in the public sector. Kiwi build often comes up in these discussions. An answer to isn't this just Kiwi build again is no. Kiwi Build didn't focus on public housing, it focused on affordable housing. And as many um, housing um, people told me in the private sector, Kiwi Build actually relied on private contracted out developers. It wasn't an in-house service. Wouldn't this involve an increase in government debt, a massive increase in government debt if we were to build a million homes? One good answer to that is New Zealand's government debt is actually very low as a percentage to GDP compared to other countries like the UK or the US or even Japan. So we can afford an increase in government debt, especially when what we're getting out of this are a set of public assets that provides a revenue stream. Lastly, doesn't competition in the market mean we're gonna get better housing because you've got different providers working with each other? We addressed that in the report. Actually, at the moment, competition in the market isn't creating very much innovation in the construction center, construction sector. The construction center isn't very innovative or productive. Competition isn't working to drive up standards and actually in many areas, it's driving down standards. So that's one way to answer some of those counter arguments. So that's a really quick breezy trip through um, why this makes economic sense too. But I just wanna reiterate what everyone else says that um, we can win these arguments for public housing and for public housing futures. It's been done before and we can do it again. And I hope what I've said um, just adds to the case for public housing in Aotearoa New Zealand today. Back over to you, Kirsten. Thank you, Max. And I have to say, um, there's not enough rhyming in those acrostic poems for me, but I, I appreciate um, the commitment to helping us remember all of those amazing points. Thank you. I'm aware that we, we are fast running out of time, but we have some really amazing questions. I'm gonna pick out one for now, um, but, for you to remember, the questions are still open. And if there's interest, we can either do a follow-up event, we can put out more information, we might have another hui where your questions help shape where we go. So please don't feel like they are all lost, but we did want to make tonight short and sweet so you can have the rest of your evening. And so my, my question, and just a quick answer if, if you can, <laughs> um, the question is how might public housing reduce commodification of housing. So how, how does it actually help? And I wonder whether or not um, one of you might have, have a thought on that. Kia ora. Um, my one thought around that is that 
public housing, when it's built at scale in a community or in an area, if it was built in abundance um, across a whole city, it, it actually helps to regulate the private market. Um, it makes housing um, more broadly more affordable um, because if you have really, really good public housing and you have lots of it and it's available to a lot of people, um, private renters that are currently paying too much rent um, will be like, why am I paying so much rent for a cold, damp house when I could have this beautiful public home? And then you start to see a process of decommodification happening um, through people moving into public housing and housing no longer being a source of profit for private landlords. And so that's just my one contribution to that and hope that others have some other discussion around it. I'll just jump in really quickly. I think Vanessa's answered that quite fully, but if decommodification just means making housing less of a commodity, then if we increase the amount of public housing in our overall housing stock, we are taking housing out of the market. Um, and that decommodifies housing because we're making it into less of a market um, item and into something that is more like a right. Um, again, amazing questions and, and please, um, there's a chance for you to share some more, but this is just to start to interest you in, in public housing futures and, and what they could look like. So, thank you to all of our speakers tonight, our interpreters and everyone who helped make this event happen. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for coming along. Um, we will be taking note of these questions and they will help shape where we go next. Before you head off though, can you please let us know what you thought of tonight? So in the chat box very soon, there will be a link to a very quick feedback form. Like we've tried to make it real quick. Okay, people, we don't want you spending all night on this. Um, there's a link that's just come up there. And that is a, a chance to share some of your top of mind thoughts after hearing this. What did you think after hearing this? Um, what are some of the big questions that are in your mind for now? Um, tonight has been the start of a conversation, but we do think that more action is needed. What we're talking about here is ultimately pushing back on private market thinking that has been able to dominate our housing system. You know, we don't even talk about a housing system anymore. We talk about a housing market. You know, we don't talk about a health market or a hospital market or an education market. We talk about a housing market. And that's because the logic of the market has completely taken over how we think about how, how we think about houses and homes and the places that we need to be able to live. So this is a start, but more action is needed. If you might like to get more involved in this kaupapa, um, we are talking about having a campaign next year on public housing. So talk to us. Let's keep talking. And there's an option in the feedback form to get involved in different kinds of ways. And ultimately, we're here because we don't think the housing crisis will solve itself on its own. It hasn't. We've been talking about a crisis for two to three years now. Um, it's become our new normal. We can't have that. And it's actually up to all of us to be able to push for housing futures that look after us and all. And we think public housing is one of those options that will make a huge difference. Thank you again for attending. And I'll just finish up with a closing karakia to send us on our way. Unu here, unu here. Unu here, kiti uru tapunui, kia watia, kia mama, te ngako, te tinana, te wairua, te ite aratakata. Hoia rā i rongo, whaka i riaki ki ronga, tuturu whaka maua kia tina, tina, home e, hui e, tai ki e. Go well everyone, pō māri e, good night, see you again soon, kā kite.